might have been a strange place for you to expect me to cut out, but uh, I ran out of time. And actually, it's a pretty good place because this next part, it still deals with homeostasis, but this is a positive feedback. And just like you should not think of our usual connotations of positive and negative when you think about this feedback loop, it's a good lesson here because a positive feedback loop is not any better or any worse than a negative feedback loop if it's a positive feedback loop that is supposed to be occurring. Sometimes positive feedback leads to problems because positive feedback is going to be self-amplifying. The more change that occurs, you get more change in that direction. And there are a couple of places that we will deal with this year where that is very important. When the signals to begin childbirth start, those signals amplify other signals and make the childbirth occur as quickly and safely as possible. Proteins, uh, sorry, blood clotting. When blood clots, when you expose blood to the air, to a, something that makes it want to close the vessel, you want that to go just as quick as you possibly can. So that pushes the signal of a clot pushes for more clots. There are other examples, uh, some in protein digestion and generation of nerve signals, but the most common ones we will use during the year are childbirth and blood clotting. Again, positive feedback when it's uh, the correct situation can be good, but it also can be dangerous sometimes. Runaway fevers uh, are the result of brain changes that lead to a positive feedback loop Childbirth is a good example of when you want to use positive feedback in blood clotting. All right, we're gonna talk a little about the movement of materials. Those would be gradients and flow. So matter and energy tend to flow down gradients. A gradient is a place where you have a difference in either chemical concentrations, charges, temperatures, pressure between two points, and so, Blood, for example, flows down a pressure gradient. There's higher pressure where the heart is, less when you reach the capillaries. Chemicals flow down concentration gradients. We'll be talking about this numerous times in the near future, uh, getting things from one side of a plasma membrane to another. Electrical particles flow down an electrical, or uh, charged particles flow down an electro an electrical gradient and we call this an electrochemical gradient so whether they are electrons or ions uh, they will go, tend to move uh, opposites attract heat will flow down a thermal gradient movement in the opposite of direction of a gradient is going to require spending metabolic energy you're going to have to use a pump instead so if you put a wagon up the hill you can ride that wagon down the hill, but when you get it up the hill, you got to put in energy to lift it. And the same is going to be true when we are dealing with the movement of materials. If we can get things into the cell and it's down their concentration gradient, there are situations where we can just get them down the hill. Uh, other times we'll have to pump them in. And we'll talk more about these pressure gradients uh, and chemical gradients as we get into the cells and tissues and we'll be looking at examples throughout the year. So about 90% of our current medical terms come from about 1,200 Greek and Latin roots reflecting the ancient study of medicine. The Renaissance brought some progress, but it also added confusion, structures and names uh, differently in various company, uh, countries. Some structures are named after people. Uh, in 1895, it's the anatomists together established worldwide naming conventions, got rid of many uh, eponyms or things that named after people, but not all, and used unique Latin names. There, uh, the uh, Terminologia Atomica, or the TA, as I like to say, provides a standard international anatomical terms. 
provides the Latin names and in English equivalents. In 1998, it was approved by anatomists in over 50 countries, and that's why sometimes you'll hear me talk about a structure, or uh, generally a structure, an anatomical structure, that when I learned it many years ago, the still used terms uh, that referred to the anatomist who first described it rather than its structure or function. So anatomical, anatomical terminology is based on word elements like roots, prefixes, and suffixes. Uh, scientific terms have one root with a core meaning, and by combining vowels or joint roots into a word, prefixes or suffixes may modify the meaning of the root word. Uh, acronyms we sometimes use are words that are pronounced from the first letter, first few letters of a series of words. A PET scan is a positomic, positronic emissions topography scan. Plurals and possessive forms and adjectives can uh, mess you up a little bit when you first get going. Cortex versus cortices, corpus versus corpora, biceps, brachii, uh, two branches. Uh, adjectives can appear different than a noun form, so a brachium is the arm, a brachii is refers to of the arm. These are things that you'll get used to as we go through it, but it's going to require you to get in, do the heavy work of reading, learning, and uh, following along. Pronunciation, the uh, best thing I can you to do is use the anatomy and physiology revealed feature. Uh, the, those pronunciations are correct pronunciations. I have been trained by uh, individuals from several different nationalities and sometimes British pronunciations are different than American pronunciations. Uh, not that that makes it wrong, but if you want to be exactly right, you want to go with the um, accepted pronunciation guide. Spelling is important in anatomy and physiology. You can have similarly spelled words that mean very different things, and that is very important in the healthcare profession, and I believe most of you will be taking medical terminology, and they will really hound that into you. So we've got a unity of form and function, the cell theory, evolution, hierarchy of complexity, homeostasis, and gradient flows. Homeostasis is probably the most important thing we talked about today, the thing that's going to be with you uh, directly throughout the course. If we talk a little bit about medical imaging, we can have we, uh, radiography, strictly speaking, is just x-rays. Over half of all medical imaging is x-rays. Uh, we have digital subtraction, angiography, is using uh, blood flow. Here's a radiological image of the head. Uh, here's a DSA of the head. Computed tomography or CT scan, also often referred to as a CAT scan, although it is not, are still x-rays, low intensity x-rays with a computer analysis. Magnetic resonance imaging uh, gives you a higher quality than a CT scan and no x-ray exposure. Uh, MRIs are great for soft tissue, much better than x-rays. A functional MRI, uh, when we talk about the brain, we may mention this, is going to show changes uh, occurring in the brain, metabolic changes occurring within the brain. Positron emission topo topograph tomography, PET, uh, assesses metabolic state of tissues uses injected radioactively labeled glucose, image colors shows tissues that use the most, glu most glucose at that moment, damaged tissues appear dark under such imaging. Sonography is the second oldest, second most widely used that uses all high frequency sound waves to echo back from internal organs. It avoids harmful x-rays, so obstetrics often use sonography. However, the images are not extremely sharp like they are in some of the other imaging techniques. All right, that should wind up chapter one for us, so thank you.